Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. Today we're going to discuss an unfolding, if still under-recognized, global mental health crisis. To discuss that crisis with two people who are on the front lines of thinking about and coping with the challenge. Dr. Jonathan DiPiero is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York and is a practicing clinician. Mike DeConchuk is an applied neuroscience researcher working, among other places, in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Most conversations about the pandemic seem to focus on health and economics, but it seems there is a mental health crisis hiding in plain sight, one that could be at least as deadly and as costly and probably lasts much longer. The nature of this pandemic, it's highly infectious and easily transmitted, means it generates fear and uncertainty. The public health responses, masks, lockdowns, social distancing, generate yet more anxiety. And now the scramble for vaccinations adds to the stress. You both spend a lot of your time, probably most of your time, dealing with the consequences of COVID. What are you seeing today? Jonathan, do you want to start? Sure, I'll start. Thank you. Um, so what I'm seeing is, as you said, that there is stress. There is stress across the globe. And it affects folks differently based on the resources they have to cope with that stress. So, for example, someone might have a lot of social support or a faith community or a lot of tools in their toolbox to manage the many stressors of the pandemic, while others might not have those advantages. And as a result of the pandemic and its ongoing nature, we're seeing that people's coping resources are sort of wearing thin. We're seeing depression develop, anxiety, panic, people turning to alcohol to help them cope, and people even thinking that they'd be better off dead or having thoughts of suicide. And this is particularly concerning among young people, among the elderly, and among essential workers, including healthcare workers. Mike, from your optic in Jordan, what do things look like? In Jordan, we have to first think about what we would call the social determinants of mental health. What goes into having good mental health in the first place? It depends a lot on, of course, biology. There's biological components to our mental health, but there are also a ton of social and economic factors that make that a little bit easier, that make the job of having good mental health easier. Like Jonathan said, strong relationships. Uh, livelihood options, um, supportive community, human touch and affection, getting your kids out of your house for a couple of hours a day, some pretty basic things that we took for granted before the pandemic started that we didn't realize how essential they were to the mental health that we did have previously. So in the same way that, you know, mental health isn't just the absence of any sort of demonstrated illness or pathology, we have to really think of, it's also not just, you know, the absence of certain things that we used to live. It's these adaptations that we've undergone. You know, adaptations in how we talk to people, how we do this virtual world, who's left behind in that virtual world. In Jordan, for example, while the world has moved to virtual meetings, there is still very weak internet connectivity in the refugee camp that I'm working in. So how are they supposed to even catch up with the ways that the world has adapted? So there's a growing social and economic divide that is further pushing people down into these cycles of what is frankly despair, which is not even a clinically recognized condition, but manifests in so many different ways and can contain multiple conditions, including anxiety, including depression, including post-traumatic stress disorder. And it becomes this spiral where the system around people conspires with loss of relationships, with individual mental health changes, to really create a dangerous cycle that is going to be hard to get out of for years. Jonathan, you mentioned suicide. I saw a study recently that said in Japan last fall, they were seeing uh, among women, uh, dramatically elevated rates of suicide, something October to October, 19 to 20, 83% increase in suicide. Um, and suicides do tend to, to go along with pandemics. 
Hong Kong saw a 30% rise in suicide during the avian flu academic years, pandemic years ago. How worried should we be about that really dramatic manifestation of, of, of a mental health problem? So anytime we think about suicide, especially myself as a clinician, we're concerned. And that concern comes along with the despair and exhaustion and the wearing thin of resources that we're seeing at a community level. So I can speak, for example, about our healthcare workers. And I have concern, and in fact, there have been cases of doctors committing suicide and nurses having thoughts of suicide and even committing suicide uh, due to just the ongoing nature of the stress and them um, not having the resources to cope and feeling like the bottom's falling out of their lives. So I do think there needs to be a large scale consideration of just the amount of, of suicidal thinking that's happening in the population across the globe and really innovative solutions to address that to really try to touch everyone affected. I know that's an impossible task um, in some ways, or feels like an impossible task. But, you know, for example, I, I was reading a study even this morning that showed that in a survey in the United States, 11% of those surveyed uh, had serious consideration of suicide in the past month. And that was particularly relevant uh, or elevated among essential workers. So there are actually sort of subpopulations that are particularly at risk. Mike, I know you've been thinking about this. What and, and Jonathan just mentioned innovative interventions. What, clearly, this is a th this is the ultimate problem, right? Uh, from this kind of stress, what do we do about it? A lot of interventions that have been designed historically for community mental health, let's say, or for mental health of communities that don't have access to primary health care services or don't um, have clinicians in their immediate proximity, we've designed things that still require some sort of basis upon which to rely, right? COVID has taught us that there is a massive abyss and people are becoming aware of that abyss that is in front of us. The systems that supposedly were fail-safes in times of crisis do not work. That has been made very clear to us through the experience of this pandemic. So whatever sense of safety nets existed went out the window. So to, to a certain extent, the playbook on what interventions to design also have gone out the window because there is no safe place. And the presumption of a lot of global mental health interventions is about getting someone to a safe space, either psychologically or first physically and literally, and then psychologically. There is no safe space in reality or in the mind. And that is becoming clear for rich and for poor. So what we have to do now is find a way to design interventions that fundamentally equip people to deal with uncertainty in a way that they have not dealt with it before, to somehow survive despite chronic uncertainty. And that is a task of creating resilience and of creating individuals that know what might be happening to their brains and bodies as they're going through a year of no one touching them, for example. Lack of social touch can have dramatic physical health effects. Increasing depression can lead to biological changes that contribute to heart disease. You know, so the physical and mental health combination here is very, very risky. And the structures that we had, we either can't access them or they're objectively unsafe. So we have to find better ways to equip people. And this is even something that the WHO has said. We have to promote self-care models because this is the only way forward to meet the massive size of the need that we have for mental health post-pandemic. What might that mean in practice? What are those kinds of new interventions? How do you build resilience, not just at an individual level, at a community level, at a national level, indeed at a global level? We saw some innovations in this space in public health in the 1970s and 1980s. There was an admission, you know, when we first uh, saw the early rumblings of, of a book called Donde No Hay Doctor, Where There Is No Doctor, that was written in Mexico in Chiapas in the late 70s, I believe. And there was a recognition that no matter how much we invest in primary health care around the world, we're not going to build enough damn hospitals. And how many people are dying as a result of simply not having a safe place to deliver a baby, or not being able to get a vaccine, to get a shot, to not having enough midwives who have enough clinical training or training by a clinician 
to deliver that baby safely. So instead of that, instead of simply waiting till we build hospitals and letting countless people die, there was an admission among public health practitioners and theorists that we have to equip people, even if they're not doctors, even if they're not professional healthcare workers, with enough knowledge that fundamentally preserves more life than it loses. And when that book first came out in the late 70s, there was massive pushback where people were saying that it is completely not only unethical, but dangerous to give lay folks such specialized knowledge. Now, fast forward 30 years plus, that book is required reading for so many different volunteers and clinicians and community workers around the world. For the Peace Corps, for UNICEF, it's been translated into 80 languages. We have almost nothing similar for mental health. There was some early work in this space by Dr. Vikram Patel in a book called Where There Is No Psychiatrist, but these initiatives haven't really gained the traction that they need because we haven't really cracked the nut of how to deliver this type of knowledge to individuals who can then deliver it safely and effectively to, again, preserve more lives than we lose. And that is the ultimate end game here. Are we preserving more life than we're losing? Because we're losing a hell of a lot of life to depression, to suicide, to increases in anxiety and despair around the world. So I'm going to piggyback on um, Mike's answer to the last question, where one of the things that we're thinking about at Mount Sinai is how to scale up support um, or make it sustainable and to reach the individual and the community, because we know that, right, we can build as many mental health clinics and open up as many private practices and train as many clinicians as we want, but um, that will not meet the need of the community, at least I'm speaking in the United States, and I'm sure the same is true across the globe. And so we're building out community partnerships. We're working with churches in the New York City community to train faith leaders and and delivering resilience-focused content to their parishioners so that there's a sustainable model of this being integrated into the practices of these local churches that are really hard hit by the pandemic. We're working on digital health tools to bring resilience content to first our healthcare workers in the broader community. And we're also working on peer support models. We're enlisting uh, folks who are frontline healthcare workers in the institution and supporting each other, training them in the basics of uh, psychological first aid, um, recognizing stress responses and bridging to resources. So to sort of go from build something from the ground up rather than sort of top down uh, with bigger structures, because that will never, um, those big structures like clinics will never meet the need. Let me complicate it even further because the assumption, continuing assumption, is that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that indeed we're close to the end of this. Uh, increasingly, there is concern that uh, about long COVID. And by long COVID, I don't mean the individual case of individuals that struggle with, with symptoms for a long time. I mean a COVID, a, a global pandemic that's becoming epidemic. So what happens, Jonathan, if this isn't almost over, but rather is another year or two or three or whatever, um, how do we how do we cope? I think we're going to continue to see a wearing down of people's um, ability to cope, and more folks will be seeking care. One would hope, but more folks will be in distress. The depression and anxiety and even PTSD will become even more entrenched if there isn't a kind of service of um, of any sort to meet that need. At the same time, we're also seeing as it goes on, increased innovation in service delivery. So for example, telehealth, which was very delivered in some services in some parts of the United States and across the globe more readily before the pandemic has become the norm. And one would hope as if the pandemic continues that structures are put in place to make sure that uh, telehealth video or telephone options are available to folks who are in need, right? But as Mike uh, pointed out, this depends on infrastructure. Um, there are parts of the globe that don't simply don't have the infrastructure to support phone calls, or certainly not video calls with a provider, and there might not even be a provider on the other end to make to to have that support. So I think there needs to be an investment at a community level in that basic infrastructure and in 
individual, community, and national level in, um, interventions where everyone's speaking the same language of mental health and resilience. Mike? For a long time, we've let the professionalized mental health system sort of develop on its own. And the reality is that it's not that old of an industry. Yes, the psychology is quite an old field, but clinical mental health work and psychiatry is relatively young compared to other fields. Um, and we rely very, very heavily on certain diagnostic tools, which functionally are made to please insurance companies because you need to get your meds covered by somebody. So we have pretty rigid diagnostic criteria that we apply to people and try to fit them into the necessary box to prescribe the right medication or whatever it might be. But that's not so much for the purpose of the person suffering on the other end. That's to have something to be able to check off and to be able to provide to insurance providers. So the entire industry is shifting more and more towards what we call a transdiagnostic approach to care. Because people are going to be developing complex new systems and multiple forms of illness or subclinical signs of distress that cover various different symptom profiles. So the whole industry is sort of being forced to go through this reckoning of itself because the professionalized mental health care will not meet the need. It simply won't. And even the types of therapies that we have on offer for people that end up getting trickled down into developing countries are not the appropriate forms of care for those individuals. So much of the care that we provide is, for example, something like cognitive reframing, right? Cognitive reframing doesn't work when you're a dirt poor refugee who is at risk of being deported and everyone in your home country is at risk of starvation. Your thought isn't the problem. Your thought is actually quite grounded in reality. So the therapeutic models have to focus again on providing people with enough information to be able to ride out this storm because this storm is not going anywhere. And some of the things that we're working on in our lab, for example, at Beyond Conflict are simply about providing people with science that has for so long been locked in a lot of academic spaces and simply translating it into local languages and saying, you have a right to know what this pandemic, and I don't even want to blame it on the pandemic, what economic and social devastation are doing to your brain and to your body, because that information should be a right. And we should approach the uh, mental health information and psychologic information the same way from a rights-based perspective that we would approach health information. It does seem to me there's a timeline problem. In, in the sense that this mental health crisis locally, nationally, globally is getting worse at an exponential pace, is my impression as a layman. Governments don't operate at exponential rates, and there isn't even a widespread recognition beyond the WHO, which in fairness has called this a global mental health crisis. But I don't see any conversation in almost any government anywhere in the world about the need to do some of the things you both have suggested need to be done sort of urgently, which leads me to believe that most of this is not going to get done except individual initiatives at Mount Sinai, at Beyond Conflict. There's a lot of stuff going on, but is it adequate to the problem? So that's a very um, thought-provoking question. One thing that comes to mind is I think there needs to be a meeting of the minds in terms of everyone around the globe, you know, individual labs, individual hospital systems, NGOs, organizations are doing their own thing in individual places. And I think there needs to be a coming together, conferences, consortia, merging of resources, rather than waiting for governments to respond. There needs to be a coming together of folks doing the same work in the same places, sharing ideas, sharing materials, sharing what works, what doesn't work. Um, for example, we, um, across the globe, a lot of resources were put into supporting, for example, healthcare workers, um, stood up right away, deployed right away in health systems, some of which were not working at all, not used at all, um, including oftentimes 24-7 crisis lines. They were not well used, um, but others like speaking to hospital chaplains that was used quite a bit. So I think through sharing knowledge, and folks coming together, 
there might be sort of a, a cobbling together of a unified approach rather than waiting for individual countries um, and, and local governments to act. So what comes to mind is in the United States, there's a bill called the Zadroga Act that provided funding for 9-11 disaster responders. 9-11 happened in 2001. The Droga Act passed in 2011. So there was not a unified governmental response in that way uh, with guaranteed funding for 10 years. We can't wait that long because people are suffering. But and to your point, all of the global conversation at the moment, we saw this at the recent G7 meeting, is focused on vaccines, on COVAX. It's focused, which is a good focus. You need the vaccines. You need to move this along. Uh, but there's almost no conversation about the mental health piece of this, which is at least as important and probably more urgent. Mike. So when you look at donor funding in the health sector from 1995 to 2015, there's some pretty remarkable trends insofar as many, many, many types of interventions received exponential increases in funding over those 20 years, 20 key years in the development of the public health field. Things like funding for malaria, for maternal and child health, for sexual and reproductive health. These are good things that we saw skyrocketing investment over 20 years in those health sectors. However, funding for mental health, despite a massively growing need, stayed completely static over those 20 years. So part of this is because the mental health sector first has, has two major problems. First is cost effectiveness. We have relegated options for the poor, that they have to be cost effective, right? We, ha we only give poor people cheap treatments. And until we move away from that mindset, we're never going to be able to scale anything that's worth a damn. And then second of all, the problem is that these interventions are often really, really hard to replicate. So it's not that appealing to create something that's going to require another massive investment in another place. So we're going to have to take a lesson from the virus here and go viral. And in the same way that you have tons of crap health information, gargle salt water, eat a bunch of raw ginger, stick garlic somewhere you don't want to stick it, all this information circulating on the internet about how to prevent COVID, we're going to end up, no matter what we try doing, we're going to end up with same crappy advice on mental health, and we're going to have to have fact checkers and work with communities to work through disinformation and misinformation. But there is not another option forward if we want to get people life-saving information at scale going to have to go viral and it's going to carry risks with it but there is not another way because donors aren't going to invest they're not going to invest it's never going to be cheaper and they're too risk averse to ever invest in viral marketing well here's the problem if you have a significant increase in suicide if you have a dramatic increase in stress that translates into an even greater loss of trust in institutions and politicians if that morphs into uh, people in the street we're seen in countries as disparate as the Netherlands, parts of the States. We're seeing people say, release me, I want out, which is blames the politicians for the disease rather than, and, 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 is, not, and is counterproductive. How do, you, how do we break, this is an unfair question and it's an unanswerable question, but how do we break that cycle? One of the things that might go toward this, but is also quite challenging, is reestablishing a sense of trust. Trust in institutions, trust in leaders, trust in your neighbor, that we have each other's backs. That's not been the case, certainly these past few years. And in fact, with the virus, we see a breaking of social bonds, and um, those have not been reestablished. But I think basic trust has to be the starting place for any kind of healing that takes place. Basic trust in folks providing medical information that the vaccine is vaccines are safe and don't contain microchips basic trust that when you um voice that you're having mental health concerns that you're not going to be fired from your job or not be able to get a new job basic trust that the people in your community care about you and want you to do well that or all in a boat together, maybe not the same boat, but we're all sort of on the same ocean together. I think we have to look into culture a little bit. We have to think about privilege. Stepping outside of the U.S. for a second, you know, I've lived the pandemic in two different, in multiple different places, actually, a couple of places in the Middle East and in the U.S. 
My life in the U.S. is one of much more privilege, where there is an expectation in my day-to-day -day life that I am not going to die from something unless it's a freak accident. The privileged world has a very interesting relationship with death compared to the global poor. Right? I've noticed here in Jordan that there's a certain, there's a different and to an arguably healthier relationship with death that there's not this negotiation that I'm going to be protected from all things because chances are someone in my recent past or immediate family has been killed in an airstrike, in a bomb, because they've been a refugee, because there was a protest, because there was a violent attack, whatever it might be. So I do think that privileged communities, individuals with tremendous privilege that have been sheltered from injustice, from injustice and unjust deaths their entire lives, are having a much bigger reckoning from a mental health perspective than poor communities are. And if you look at the United States, it has some of the worst statistics for infections and deaths compared to other parts of the world. So I also think the precautions that are needed, those cries for let me out, let me out, let me out, the ones that are newsworthy and leading to super spreader events and are going crazy, we're seeing more publicity on those from certain places that we wouldn't expect to see either those attitudes, those behaviors, or those amount of deaths from. So look at what's being covered in the news. Look at whose deaths are being made a big deal about in the news. And I think we have to take a serious look at how we, as the privileged in the world, interact with and think about death. And I know that's a hard thing to do, but this is fundamentally also not just about depression, suicide, anxiety, PTSD. This is about grief and loss. And we're going to have to go through a serious process of renegotiating our relationship with those things and being more and more comfortable with emotions that so much of the world lives day in and day out. And that is a grief response to tremendous and suffocating injustice. Let me grab one element of that, because as you both know, one of the stories, storylines that's gotten the most attention is that many people have not, they claim, been allowed to grieve, that they've lost parents and grandparents without any kind of interaction, that funerals are no longer permitted, which seems to have made everything dramatically worse. Jonathan, Mike, I think, makes a terrific point that uh, clearly the shock of COVID in a place like Germany or the United States or Japan is far more severe than it is in Kenya or Jordan or South Africa just because of the level of development, air quotes on the word development. How, how do we get to where Mike just suggests we need to get to is, is to think differently about life and death? That's a small question there. Very small question, yeah. Very easily answered. You know, I think Mike is, Mike is right on the nose and what you brought up is really important, right? There's been a disruption of ritual. People use rituals like um, going to the grave to have an inter internment, having a memorial service, having a funeral, um, having a mourning period where relatives come over and cook food for two or three weeks and share stories of loved ones. I come from a big Italian family. Funerals are actually kind of raucous sometimes, and there's a lot of storytelling and sharing of experiences. That's all disrupted. I know folks who um, are ever churchgoers, they've lost 20 or 30 people in their congregations. So something that actually was a comfort has now become a source of loss. And, you know, I think Mike is absolutely right. There, need, there is an increasing um, awareness of mortality and of death. And in places where that has not been part of the conversation, that leads to old psychoanalysts, what they call death anxiety. And when you have death anxiety, when you're confronted with the reality of death, you do all sorts of things that are generally unpleasant. It makes you feel really disquieted. It makes you cling to your uh, political beliefs even stronger. It makes you cling to the folks that look like you and talk like you even stronger. It makes you less flexible in your thinking. And um, it puts a lot of distance between you and other folks who you see as different or potentially threatening. So I think that that's something that needs to be right. If, if death is more salient, then people have to sort of learn to reckon with that in a way that's not destructive and distancing. Um, and, and rips at social bonds. 
I think Mike is absolutely correct in that way. And we know that from the social psychological literature, um, you know, what people do with death anxieties to um, cling to previously held beliefs and just reject any other information because it's simpler. One implication of what you're both saying is that this shock, which is a continuing ongoing shock, is going to shake up our cultures, our societies, our countries in ways that we probably can't even begin to guess. What could happen to knock us into a better place? What could get us to take this crisis and do some of the things you both suggested ought to be done, both at a personal individual level, at a community level, nationally, even global level? How do we get to a better place from a crisis? One, one thing I would say is that there's that old saying, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And in terms of optimism, rather than thinking about what's going to happen a year from now or even a month from now, think about maybe the individual and leaders should think about what you can do today to make your moment better. Um, and that at the individual level, that might mean doing something that brings you joy that day. If there is something that you can connect to or for a leader, what can you do to make the people you are responsible for and to make their lives a little bit better that day? Um, and so I think that taking those small steps across the sort of power spectrum of um, communities and at scale would go a long way. Small steps. Building on that. You know, the human brain has one job. You know, you have one job to do, brain, and that is to keep me alive. So, one of the worst things you can give to the human brain is chronic uncertainty. And the name of the game since March 2020 is uncertainty. In the same way, we're seeing seismic shifts in political identity, in power structures, in the world order on a massive scale that was already happening pre-COVID. And we're seeing accelerations and changes to that. And one of the biggest things that I think we're seeing is the de-exceptionalizing of the United States and the de-exceptionalizing of the European experience to a certain extent, because shit's just as messed up there as far as organization, as far as distributions, as far as humanitarian responses. If you've never had to undertake a humanitarian response, everyone's going to think you're great at it. So here from Jordan, it's sort of looking like a de-exceptionalizing of that narrative. And for people that are living on that edge, observing or thinking about what comes after that seismic shift is far more unpleasant than whatever comes out on the other end of it. Because fundamentally, everyone around the world is most concerned, and this is, again, very, very normal from a social psychological perspective, this is about status threat. Who am I going to be in the world, in my society, at the other end of this, whenever the hell that might be? And that anxiety of not knowing how your status is going to shift is obviously going to provoke a ton of negative thinking, assumptions about your status shifting far more dramatically than it actually will. But that process is going to be deeply painful and much more painful. So all I can say, right, is that it is a, a poem by Jose Martí where it says, y todo, es, uh, y todo como el diamante antes que luces carbón. That everything but before coming a diamond is just coal. And the process of coal undergoing tremendous pressure is incredibly horrible. But we do not know what is going to come out on the other end of this. And the de-exceptionalizing of the United States, the de-exceptionalizing of experiences of privilege vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world may in fact be a very good thing 10 years from now. So I'm not entirely pessimistic. I'm pessimistic about the next two to three to five years, not about the next 10, because this could lead to things as big as the erasure of borders. Because virus didn't respect it, why do we have to? Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you ended with a provocative question, because we clearly live in a moment where there are more questions than answers. I want to thank Dr. Jonathan DiPiero and Mike Nikonchuk for their work, their insights, and yes, even their wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org, and please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.